Whoop. <laughs> we are not here. <laughs> no, I hear you. Not here. No, agreed, agreed. <laughs> It'd be kind of weird even oh if we were. God. Just in case you think we're just like dicking around or something. Well, um, but that's pretty awesome, yeah. <laughs> We're reading Dale Carnegie's How to oh. Win Friends and Influence People right. uh, in an effort to do that. Um, so we're just going kind of chapter by chapter. We've done mm -hmm. the prologue. We did part one of chapter one. Those are videos on YouTube now. Yeah, we made videos. Edited. We don't read the whole thing in the YouTube videos, but we do respond to phrases and stories. I think we get the idea across. I think like, we're if you don't better. feel like reading the whole thing, I think it's a good way to do it. Because actually some of this stuff, I mean, sure, you can read it. It's fine. Yeah. But um, he goes off. He goes off on tangents, right? <laughs> sometimes, sometimes, sometimes I wonder. Sometimes he tells long, multiple long stories in a <laughs> row <laughs> right. about different people that are old-timey people. And we kind of skim them. And I think we make that apparent. But it's kind of um, fun. In the videos, it is fun. But we did follow his advice, though, so far. Because he did promise. And here was the Dale Carnegie promise on this book. Was that if you follow the first three chapters. And actually did it. And took action on it. And all that stuff. That like magic. Like magic. Three chapters. Three chapters. Your like magic. Just you would change. see. Yeah, I guess your life just changing. Is that... What was the actual promise there? I think, no, he was, he was basically, I think the actual promise was like better connections, you know, more money, you know, just better all around quality of life thing. Well, like the guy with the hard hat was mm -hmm. having an easier time at work. Yeah. And getting people to wear their hard hats. And I think it was, that's Things the thing. To go smoother. What he was promising was not super specific. He was definitely kind of told in a story. Yeah, he tells a lot of stuff in a story. That's his main... And a story about people and somehow trying to... I think a lot of times he tries to illustrate the principle. I think, you know, other times, like, he's really into Lincoln. And, you know, he just sort of wants to get a story about Lincoln in. So he throws a couple in, right? Like, how important you. was the big, long story about Lincoln? I'm not really sure, you know, last chapter. So that was last he chapter. He had a point. We did make videos of all this if you to. guys want to see these, by the way. I where we talked about the earlier chapters. The, the, but the basic homework we had from last time was yeah, the not home, basic to, homework. The right. basic homework was to not criticize, condemn, or complain. And that was kind of our first lesson. Yeah. We so. took it to heart, and it was interesting. I, I've felt changes from it it was difficult and we definitely had some conundrums yeah i would say in general i thought it was good because <clears throat> i don't know how well i did it but it really made me aware when i was doing it and it also made me aware that like sometimes my natural go-to was to criticize and i do see it kind of made me realize, so I mean, I will say this about the book already. It made me realize that that really was, it kind of showed me. And I guess that's what he was saying he was going to do. It showed me that the times when I would criticize, and when, and this, this week I didn't. And I think it went uh, a lot better. The homework we were given was don't criticize, complain, or condemn. That was really difficult to stick to. I think one of my favorite stories about it is we have... A, a local sports team. Yeah. The Loggers. And they have a sign. And the sign says, Go Loggers. Right. But the font is terrible on the sign. And so it looks, just for a second, like it says, Go Losers. Yeah, Go Losers. <laughs> go <right>. Losers. <laughs> and I made fun of the sign. And then we had to have this long discussion. We were like, wait a minute, is that criticizing? Am I criticizing? Because, like, that's tough to give right. up. And But then we were like, no, that was just making a joke. Like, that right. wasn't mean-spirited even. Right. So we, uh, we think that's... Obviously, you have to have a sense of humor. Right. Like, so, it goes to that, you know. So we did have that confrontation, right? There have been a number of things like that through the week. Where I'm just not certain if I'm allowed to say this thing. Is this a cr 
criticism or a condemnation or a complaint or or not and so we actually looked up a lot about what is a complaint specifically and i think that was actually really instructive and i actually think that the times when i was about to complain and didn't the fact that i didn't complain made things better so i saw it for sure you know we had to do some customer service stuff it worked it went like a charm. Smoothly. This is the first time um, I've heard Sean on the phone with a customer service rep. And it worked great. Pleasant. Dude like patient. took off fees and shit. Right. Yeah, so I will say there was a little bit of magic. Like maybe. That maybe a little bit. You know. Yeah. Remember this whole journey kind of started with poor customer service interaction. Dude, you're right. I'm not the whole poor customer right. service. I'm saying the whole it was interaction with our was phone. negative and, and it didn't Mm -hmm. work at all that kind of started us on this betterment journey because <laughs> i got to see like in person and personally like in the moment it not working and it did it did remind me of that because i got annoyed with the person at the phone store mm -hmm. i won't even say but yeah and you know we didn't get anything we wanted we left with nothing we wanted mm -hmm. and it really got me thinking i was like hey wait a minute like what was our aim though what did we want to get out of that like we Not got an nothing. argument. Yeah, we got nothing out of it. We got annoyed and angry and then nothing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I was like, okay, it kind of got me thinking a lot of it. And this is, well, it's led here, basically. And, and the person that helped us got annoyed and angry and nothing. They got nothing either. They just had a lose. crappy day. Yeah, They right. could have made some money. We could have gotten what we wanted. But instead, we both just None of were that angry happened. and didn't get anything. <laughs> so it was like, after that experience, I was like, oh, okay, all right, I kind of... We need to be able you know, to be in more control than that. We that doesn't make sense. Like lose control yeah, and have chaos, even, you know, yeah, right, and right. anger. <laughs> so uh, in our way. Know. So here we are. So we did that. So that's what happened last week. Anyway, do you want to start? Is it time to begin this week? Which is the big secret of dealing with people. I want to know. There's only one way under high heaven to get anybody to do anything. Did you ever stop to think of that? Yeah, yes. Okay. Just one way. The belt. What? <laughs> no. Okay. What actually is it? It's by making the other person want to do it. Oh. Mm -hmm. Remember, there's no other way. Okay. All right. I'm, I'm with you here. Of course. You can make someone want to give you his watch by sticking a revolver in his ribs. Oh, I see. I see. You can make your employees give you cooperation until your back is turned by threatening to fire them. You can make a child do what you want it to do by a whip or a oh, threat. He did bring up the he belt. He got the belt. <laughs> I was just kidding, but this was the 30s. Dale wasn't kidding. He got the belt. Yeah, right. I but. But these crude methods have sharply undesirable repercussions. Yeah. The only way I can get you to do anything is by giving you what you want. Mm -hmm. What do you want? Sigmund Freud said that everything you and I do springs from two motives. The sex urge and the desire to be great. John Dewey, one of America's most profound philosophers, phrased it a bit differently. Dr. Dewey said that the deepest urge in human nature is the desire to be important. Remember that phrase, the desire to be important. It is significant. Oh. You are going to hear a lot about that in this book. There's one longing, almost as deep, almost as imperious as the desire for food and sleep, which is seldom gratified, it is what Freud calls the desire to be great. It is what Dewey calls the desire to be important. Oh my God. This goes right in. You know what this is making me think about? The Thierry Tilly story. He had this whole family just told them the story and just like took all their money like gradually over the years by making them think that they were like this super important family that was destined to fight evil or something. They were landed and titled. Yeah, they were like, yeah, royalty or so nobility or something like that. Is that what titled means? Yeah, they had yeah. titles like, I don't know. Duke of Dukes Abercrombie some, and yeah. Fitch. <laughs> That was the one, yeah. Yeah, yeah, right. And mm. he did lead them to believe that they were supposed to save France or something. Save France from something. From, yeah. I'm know. not really sure what. The end times or whatever. Yeah. 
And he did. He made them believe they were great and important, and it worked. They gave him everything. Yeah, yeah. What was that? We saw that it was like a Oki's Weird Stories or something. It was a it was a cool the uh, cult of Tiri Tilly. Yeah, it was a cool documentary series. Five actually. Part. Well, this just it leapt into my mind when I heard um, the desire to be important. Lincoln once began a letter saying, "Everybody likes a compliment." William James said, "The deepest principle in human nature is the craving to be appreciated." He didn't speak, mind you, of the wish or the desire, the longing to be appreciated. He said, the craving to be appreciated. Mm -hmm. Here is a gnawing and unfaltering human hunger. And the rare individual who honestly satisfies this heart hunger will hold people in the palm of his or her hand. And even the undertaker will be sorry when he dies. Dale does have a very big desire himself to have people be a little sorry when he dies. Yeah. He talks about this a lot. I bet he succeeded, though. Yeah, I bet people were weeping. He probably had people weeping and stuff. <laughs> yeah. My father pinned his blue ribbons on a sheet of white muslin. And when friends or visitors came to the house, he would get out the long sheet of muslin. Which is some kind of cloth. It's a cloth. And it was rolled up and he had blue ribbons. Okay, he, he would hold one end and I would hold the other while he exhibited the blue ribbons. Here's my hog ribbons. Admire them. <laughs> the hogs didn't care about the ribbons they'd won. Yeah. But father did. These prizes gave him a feeling of importance. It was this desire for a feeling of importance that led an uneducated, poverty-stricken grocery clerk to study some law books he found in the bottom of a barrel of household plunder that he'd bought for 50 cents. Don't do it, Dale. You've probably heard of this grocery clerk his name lincoln lincoln it was lincoln it was lincoln the whole time he just did it again yeah he even did the lincoln. whole like joke thing with like you probably heard of this grocery clerk his name lincoln yeah it was pretty amazing go ahead loren i that was an amazing moment thank you it was this desire for a feeling of importance that inspired Dickens to write his immortal novels. This desire makes you want to wear the latest styles, drive oh. the latest cars, and talk about your brilliant children. He's going it somewhere with this. It is true, though. He's going somewhere with Oh, just with in this. case you missed it, the desire he's talking about is the desire to feel important. If you tell me how you get your feeling of importance, I'll tell you what you are that determines your character. That is the most significant thing about you. That's interesting. You know, this is something to think about when making characters for our stories and games. And for Cloudy Bay. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. For example, John D. Rockefeller got his feeling of importance by giving money to erect a modern hospital in Peking, China. To care for millions of poor people who he had never even seen and never would see. You can tell Dale Carnegie's kind of like, not sure why this fucker did that. But hey. That was his yeah, thing. That was his fucking know. thing, you know. Dillinger, on the other hand, got his feeling of importance by being a bandit, a bank robber, and a killer. When the FBI agents were hunting him, he dashed into the farmhouse up in Minnesota and said, I'm Dillinger. He was proud of the fact that he was public enemy number one. I'm not going to hurt you, but I'm Dillinger, he said. <laughs> the one significant difference between Dillinger and Rockefeller is how they got their feeling of importance. History sparkles with amusing examples of famous people struggling for a feeling of importance. Sparkles. That's great. History sparkles. Hmm. Even George Washington wanted to be called His Mightiness, the President of the United States. <laughs> ah, I'm glad we stopped that. Did we, I'm glad we didn't do that. His Mightiness. His fucking Mightiness. Okay. The writer Mary Roberts Reinhardt once told me of a bright, vigorous young woman who became an invalid in order to get a feeling of importance. Some authorities declare that people may actually go insane in order to find, in the dreamland of insanity, the feeling of importance that has been denied them in the harsh world of reality. <laughs> yeah, no, no doubt. Going to bring up again, this was 1936. I'm yeah, sure there have been... Yeah, these facts, yeah, are... Some amendments to these facts. Uh, anyway, sorry, I was thirsty. Yeah, no worries. This is a stream now. We can. That's the cool thing. I'm loving these videos that we're making because it's like now it makes the stream like way more chill. Like I don't care anymore. Like that we we don't have to make the whole thing. 
cool. Right, because we can edit it and we can just get edit rid parts of the... out that are just dumb. I leave in some of the dumb stuff. I leave in. We do a leave good some of the, of the dumb, dumb stuff. stuff honestly. Some of the dumb stuff is funny, but some of what it. What would we be without the dumb stuff? Well, not much, Loren. <laughs> not much. Why do these people go insane? We were talking about. So he's still wondering why people go crazy. I put that question to the head physician of one of our most important psychiatric hospitals. So this guy knows this stuff. This doctor, who's received the highest honors and the most coveted awards for his knowledge of this subject, told me frankly that he didn't know why people went insane. I have one question for you guys. What would be your solution for relaxed conversations and finding new friends? Okay, well, we actually did um, apply a successful thing. I'm not saying it, you know, works for everybody, but, you know, it does take a little bit of money, too, because you have to go out. But you have to find a place that, like, has a fire, and you just sit around the fire, and you can talk to anybody around the fire. It's like a sort of universally acknowledged... Universal signifier for being open towards socializing the fire that's so deep in our past and our history yeah i i think that we're yeah. just drawn to it that's the best way i've found so yeah we found a place a we found a, a bar that had that and we went and we just sat and yeah we made friends cheap beers you know we we outside know, even you know called got people's numbers and you know called them on the other weekends and stuff once you've done it a couple times then you start going out with people you already know and it's even more fun you know what i mean am i still reading Yes, I think you're... Oh, <clears throat> so this important guy, this important doctor tells him this story. Are you guys oh, ready yeah. for this? Oh, yeah, the important doctor I have, story. He, he, man, this dude's name dropping a lot. I have a patient right now whose marriage proved to be a tragedy. She wanted love, sexual gratification, children, and social prestige, but life blasted all of her hopes. Aww. Her husband didn't love her. her. He refused even to eat with her and forced her to serve his meals in his room upstairs. She had no children, no social standing. She went insane. And in her imagination, she divorced her husband and resumed her maiden name. She now believes she has married into English aristocracy. And she insists upon being called Lady Smith. And as for children, she imagines now that she has had a new child every night. Every time I call on her, she says, Doctor, I had a baby last night. Life once wrecked all her dreams. What the... Life once wrecked... This is a terrible story, by the way. Thanks, Dale, for this one. Life once wrecked all her dream ships on the sharp rocks of reality, but in the sunny fantasy isles of insanity, all her barkentines race into port with canvas billowing and wind winging through the masts. Wow. Huh? What was that? Dale Carnegie went off there. That was insane. Okay. Tragic? Oh, I don't know. Her physician said to me, if I could stretch out my hand and restore her sanity, I wouldn't do it. She's much happier as he, she is. Damn, bro. Wow. Where are you going with this? See, this was 1936. He was like, we'll just give her a lobotomy. Probably. That's, you know. If some people are so hungry for a feeling of importance that they actually go insane to get it. That's, wow. Imagine what miracle you and I can achieve by giving people honest appreciation this side of insanity. Why did Andrew Carnegie pay a million dollars a year or more than $3,000 a day to Charles Schwab? That's a good question. I wouldn't mind even... that Man, even in 1936, I'd still take those rates, man. Are you kidding me? All right. Let's hear it. Why? Why, Why did he do such a thing? Because Schwab was a genius? Nope. Mm -mm. Because he knew more about the manufacture of steel than other people? Nonsense. Here's his secret set down in his own words. All right. Words that... Ought to be cast in eternal bronze <laughs> and nice. hung in every home and school, every shop and office in the land. Words that children ought to memorize instead of wasting their time memorizing the conjugation of Latin verbs or the amount of the annual rainfall in Brazil. Go off, bro. Words that will all but transform your life and mine if we will only live them. All right, let's hear these bronzed words through the ages. I consider my ability to arouse enthusiasm among my people, said Schwab, the greatest asset I possess. And the way to develop the best that is in a person is by appreciation and encouragement. There's nothing else that so kills the ambitions of a person as criticisms from superiors. I never criticize anyone. I believe in giving a person incentive to work. So I am anxious to praise, but loathe to find fault. 
If I like anything, I am hearty in my approbation and lavish in my praise. Link asks, so what have you learned so far? So we've learned basically the first one, his whole thing is this book's an action book. You have to put the stuff into practice. Mm -hmm. Document last and week, analyze Last progress. week's lesson. Yeah, right. Document and analyze it as you go along. Last week's was don't criticize, condemn, or complain. And we did that. We did that for a week. We tried to be really aware of it. So and, far, um, and, and we're still in the middle of this part that we're reading, but mm -hmm. so far it seems like we're gearing up for uh, be lavish in your praise. It does look that way, right. Find the good in things and mention it. Here, I'll, I'll keep going here even. Yeah. In my wide association in life, meeting with many and great people in various parts of the world, Schwab declared, I've yet to find the person, however great or exalted his station, who did not do better work and put forth greater effort under a spirit of approval than he could ever do under a spirit of criticism. Well, this kind of goes back to that first one anyway. Approval rather than criticism. Right, Encouragement. Right. That, um, Link said, lavish in praise is something I'm always as iffy on. See, you know, I don't think I've been lavish with praise either. But what's your aim been? Exactly. And now if our aim is to win friends and influence people, um, apparently being lavish with your praise is how to do it. It's not what I've done either, Link. It hasn't been my aim no. before to win friends and influence mm -hmm. people. Like I've said before, you know, I, I've been thinking previously, I don't care what other people think. It doesn't matter. I'm going to be my own fierce individual. And that hasn't worked for me. So now that right. I need to change, my aim's changing and I have to learn new rules to go by. Or, I mean, maybe it was Mother Teresa, whatever. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> that, he said, frankly, this was that guy. What's that guy's name? Schwab. He said, I've yet to find the person ever greater exalted his station who did not do better work and put forth greater effort under the spirit of approval than he would ever do under the spirit of criticism. That, he said, frankly, was one of the outstanding reasons for the phenomenal success of Andrew Carnegie. Carnegie praised his associates publicly as well as privately. Carnegie wanted to praise his assistants even on his tombstone. That he wrote his own tombstone. Maybe you shouldn't write your own tombstone, though. Sincere appreciation was one. Of, oh, that was criticism, though. That was me criticizing, though, wasn't I? Uh oh. I still have a habit. See, it doesn't go away that easy just because you do it a week. Sincere appreciation was one of the secrets of the first John D. Rockefeller success in handling men. Handling men. Oh. What would we write on our tombstone? Live it up now, buddy. How, how about live it up now, buddy? That's a good one. How about this? Death Clamp Games. Game over. Oh, that's cute. But we, if one of us dies, the other one, it's sort of like in the, uh, I don't remember what country that was, but you have to get buried too. When a study was made a few years ago on runaway wives. Runaway wives, yeah. What do you think was discovered to be the main reason wives ran away? I think I know. It was awesome. lack of appreciation. And I bet that a similar study made of runaway husbands would come out the same way. We often take our spouses so much for granted that we never let them know how we appreciate them. Mm -hmm. A member of one of our classes told of a request made by his wife. She and a group of other women in her church were involved in a self-improvement program. She asked her husband to help her by listing six things he believed she could do to help her become a better wife. He reported to the class, I was surprised by such a request. Frankly, it would have been easy for me to list six things I would like to change about her. My heavens, she could have listed a thousand things she'd like to change about me. Mm -hmm. But I didn't. I said to her, let me think about it and give you an answer in the morning. Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. Yeah. Wow, this guy's smart. That guy's been That's married a minute. Smooth. That's smooth. That guy's been married a minute. Uh, the, Link the next, asked, oh, go ahead. The next the morning, I got up very early and called the florist and had them send six red roses to my wife with a note saying, I can't think of six things I would like to change about you. I love you the way you are. <laughs> when I arrived home that evening, who do you think greeted me at the door? That's right, my wife. She was almost in tears. Needless to say, I was extremely glad I had not criticized her as she had requested. <laughs> Okay, that was some like. 30s read between the lines stuff. Mm -hmm. The following Sunday at church, after she'd reported the results of her assignment, several women with whom she'd been studying came to me and said, that was the most considerate thing I've ever heard. It was then that I realized the power of appreciation. Mm -hmm. Oh no, now the other church ladies were like, so. All the other church ladies were getting Maybe you'll appreciate that. me mm -hmm. too. 
Years ago, a teacher in Detroit asked Steve Morris to help her find a mouse that was lost in the classroom. You see, she appreciated the fact that nature had given Stevie something no one else in the room had. Nature had given Stevie a remarkable pair of ears to compensate for his blind eyes. But this was really the first time Stevie had been shown appreciation for those talented ears. Now, years later, he says that this act of appreciation was the beginning of a new life. You see, from that time on, he developed his gift of hearing and went on to become, under the stage name, Stevie Wonder, one of the great pop singers and songwriters of the 70s. So they must have added this story after 1936. Asterisk. Oh, it's an asterisk score story. All right, so this must be in the new, because I'm pretty sure Dale Carnegie did not this is a, hang out with Steve. This Wonder. is a new edition, so yeah. it might have updates and things like that. Okay, that That's how like that it. story get, okay. got in there, yeah. Some readers are seeing right now as they read these lines, oh, phooey, flattery, bear oil. I may be saying that a little bit. Bear oil. Mm-hmm. I've tried that stuff. It doesn't work, not with intelligent people. Mm. Of course, flattery seldom works with discerning people. It's shallow, selfish, and insincere. It ought to fail, and it usually does. In the long run, in the long run, flattery will do you more harm than good. Flattery is counterfeit. And like counterfeit money, it will eventually get you into trouble if mm. you pass it to someone else. Mm. King George V. Oh, I have the battleship on World of the Warships. Mm has a set of six maxims displayed on the walls of his study at Buckingham Palace. Buckingham Palace. <laughs> Sorry. Buckingham these, Palace. Buckingham Palace. <laughs> One of these maxims said, Teach me neither to proffer nor receive cheap praise. That's all flattery is, cheap praise. I once read a definition of flattery that may be worth repeating. Flattery is telling the other person precisely what he thinks about himself. Use what language you will, said Ralph Waldo Emerson. You can never say anything but what you are. If all we had to do was flatter, everybody would catch on, and we should all be experts in human relations. Now, if we stop thinking about ourselves for a while and begin to think of the other person's good points, we won't have to resort to flattery so cheap and false that it can be spotted almost before it's out of the mouth. One of the most neglected virtues of our daily existence is appreciation. The next time you enjoy filet mignon at the club, <laughs> send word to the chef that it was excellently prepared. Will do. Next time, Dale. Will do. Gotcha. And when a tired salesperson shows you unusual courtesy, please mention it. Yeah, okay. Every minister, lecturer, and public speaker knows the discouragement of pouring himself or herself out to an audience and not receiving a single ripple of appreciative comment. Oh my goodness. What applies to professionals applies doubly to workers in offices, wow. shops, and factories, and our families and friends. In our interpersonal relations, we should never forget that all, all our associates are human beings and hunger for appreciation. It is the legal tender that all souls enjoy. Hmm. Let's cease thinking of our accomplishments, our wants. Let's try to figure out the other person's good points. Then forget flattery. Give honest, sincere appreciation. Appreciation. Be hearty in your approbation and lavish in your praise. And people will cherish your words and treasure them and repeat them over a lifetime. Repeat them years after you have forgotten them. Principle two. So here it is. Give honest and sincere appreciation. There you go. Honest and sincere appreciation. All mm -hmm. right. And we're adding mm -hmm. that on to don't criticize, complain, or condemn. So whenever something is... Uh, done or we see something that's honestly worth appreciating we say so i think we're gonna have another rule here tomorrow there's been some magic already I'll a admit, little bit of I've magic some a little, little bit of magic sparkles dale thanks yeah there have been a little sparkles right <laughs> the sparkles of history mm -hmm. awesome. thanks for joining us everybody good vibes till next time good vibes <laughs>